welcome everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on investing for recovery and resilience, the innovative model of new power labs. Uh, my name is Ina Shalala. I'm the Director of Learning and Partnerships at Philanthropic Foundations Canada, PFC. Um, to begin, we would like to acknowledge the many territories of Turtle Island on which we work and reside. These territories are home to many indigenous peoples who have lived here for tens of thousands of years and continue to live here. As settlers, immigrants, and descendants, and as visitors, we honor and respect the many indigenous peoples of this land and territory and hope for a more just future together. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the discussions at any time, uh, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer your questions as much as possible during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. And if you have any comments or resources to share with all the participants, please use the chat box. Um, simultaneous translation is offered in French. La traduction simultanée disponible en français. Il vous suffit de cliquer sur l'icône interprétation uh, en bas de votre écran et sélectionner la langue française. So the topic for today's webinar is about building a more transparent, inclusive and equitable financial future. COVID-19 has brought to light society's growing inequality, uh, inequalities, systemic racism and disproportionate impact on marginalized communities. It's important for foundations to think about new and inclusive ways to move forward a world in which social and economic prosperity is enjoyed by all. Uh, with bias and discrimination in how capital flows from philanthropy to impact investing, we do have the, an opportunity and perhaps maybe an obligation to do better. Uh, so now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our amazing panelists for the session um, and to our moderator today, Narinder Dami, lead of New Power Labs and managing partner at Marigold Capital. I will be sharing a more detailed bio uh, shortly in the chat box about the great work that uh, Narinder has and is still doing. So over to you, Narinder, and thank you for being with us. Narinder, I think you're on mute. <laughs> there we go. Okay. First technical mishap of the, the afternoon. But thank you so much, um, Ines, for welcoming us here today. Uh, it, I think, will be a really interesting conversation, one that hopefully is honest, uh, that talks about where we are and the opportunity we have to grow. And, and so today, and I think folks can see my slides, all right? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So today we're going to talk about New Power Labs. And I must admit, last week, uh, je pensais que je peux faire ça tout en français. Mais vraiment, ça fait dix ans que je parle français. Et donc, j'ai décidé, c'est mieux pour vous que je fais pas ça. Yes. So I will, if I can, bring it back, but we'll, we'll keep it in mostly in English on my end. Um, so we have an, an, a really phenomenal group of individuals here with us today. We have Adam Spence. He is the founder and CEO of SVX, and I'll talk a little bit more about him and his work um, when I introduce him to speak. Um, there's Victor Beausoleil. He is the executive director of SETSI. And we have Jory Cohen, who is the director of finance and impact investing at Inspirit Foundation. So when we talk about New Power Labs, uh, this work is, is work that we've been doing at Marigold in partnership with um, an OTF, uh, with DUCA, and now with Community Foundations of Canada and a growing set of partners, um, we've had sessions in the past. Some of these sessions you may have attended. And as we went through those sessions, we always started with our identity, with who we are and what we bring. And so I wanted to begin this presentation with sharing you, uh, with you a bit of my identity. So, you know, and that is in which I stand, in which I speak, and in which I am here today. So I'm the daughter of immigrants. I, I started working really early. So at the age of 14, I had three jobs. And I essentially, for the last few years of high school, was working a full-time job, including in a factory, as I was finishing my high school. Education was always and continues to be a priority. 
I'm an electrical engineer, and I also received my MBA. My work has been both in the global south and the global north. I've worked in engineering, I've worked in investment banking, I've worked in microfinance, I've worked in venture philanthropy, and I work in impact investing. I've built two organizations, Rise Asset Development, Leap Pico Center for Social Impact, and all of this has been guided by the belief of increasing access to opportunity, which was why my parents came to Canada and what really guides me in the work that I do. I'm also, which you probably can tell, a woman of color. And, and as such, everything I look at, I look through with a gender and social, a gender and racial equity lens. And so that's what informs me. That's what informs my positions, my, my thoughts. Um, and I think we all bring a different journey to the work that we do. And so I'm gonna, so, so going back to New Power Labs, one of the things that really stood out for us as we were embarking on this work was that, you know, there, there are different types of capital that flows from philanthropy to conventional investing, to responsible investing, to sustainable investing and impact investing. And while the objective of these types of capital may be different, uh, what we've recognized and what the data shows is that there is bias and discrimination, whether we're talking about philanthropy or we're talking about traditional bank loans. And so what we're seeing, at least some of us who work in this intersectional space, when we work across silos and sectors, is there's commonality in the conversations we're having when we talk about philanthropy to those that when we talk about access to bank loans, to that that we're talking about when it comes to impact investing. And so as we move toward uh, building a more equitable financial future, how do we do it in a way where we're building a movement versus incremental conversations? And that is what led us to say, there has to be a way that we can aggregate, we can synthesize, and we could complement the work that's happening across our country to help get to that end goal. I think many of you would agree with me, which is to build a more transparent, inclusive, and equitable financial future. And we are, we are right now co-created um, with a group of founding partners, which includes Marigold Capital, Ontario Trillium Foundation, Duca Impact Lab, Community Foundations of Canada. We have another founding and funding partner from the West Coast who will be joining us soon. And we're in a conversation with a few more to round out this founding team. And you know, back to the why, it's about figuring out how we can enhance the way we collaborate. It's about figuring out how we actually build a more equitable social finance community. And it's about figuring out and solving for this fragmented and incremental approach I think many of you have felt. So 2020. 2020 was the first year I could talk about race in a way where it was accepted to some extent. At 2020 was a year in which we threw up our black squares, we committed to change, we started to qual characterize ourselves as anti-racist. We started to learn about what it means to be anti-racist. Uh, some of the data became more real about in inequity when it comes to capital flows. It was a year uh, that I think it was needed and critical for the movement that we're trying to build. It was also a year we, where we focused on awareness, where we focused on conversation, and where we focused on reflection. But the question remains, through those conversations, through that reflection, through that increased awareness, are we actually making progress? So this is a US stat, um, but in 2020, uh, black founders received just 3% of venture capital. Another US stat, and we'll talk about why I keep pointing to US stats. Uh, Women-led companies received 2.3% of venture capital funding in 2020. And this took us back to 2017 levels. When you think about it, 2020 was a year where there was a lot of uncertainty. And the way we think about risk determines how we fund. 
And when the common kind of the, the mainstream narrative is that there's greater risk investing in women, you can see why our venture capital numbers have not increased or changed. Here's a Canadian stat. Nearly 90% of investment deals publicly disclosed by Canadian venture capital funds over the last five years went to companies exclusively founded by men. Let that sink in. But women still outperform. On average, have 35% higher ROI, 12% higher revenues, and 34% higher total return to shareholders. And they and women have to overcome bias in venture capital pitch processes. And it's much more difficult for women to go through that process because of how, how bias is embedded in our structures and our systems. There was a really interesting research that came out last year where they had investors uh, listen to pitches presented both by male entrepreneurs and female entrepreneurs. And even when the content was the exact same, the preference was to the male entrepreneurs. In Canada, if we put our philanthropy hat on, um, the really important report from Carlton and the Foundation for Black Communities last year showed us that for every $100 of grant funds dispensed by 15 of the leading foundations in Canada, only 30% go to Black community organizations. And when we look at um, every $100 donated to charitable organizations in Canada, as little as seven cents go towards supporting Black charities. Edgar Villanova, I imagine many of you know and have perhaps even read his book, Decolonizing Wealth, but he, he shares that, you know, despite all of the talk of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the headway that has been made at foundations, when you still look at who is getting money, we have major injustice. Now, if I move over to loans and lending, um, Duca Impact Lab um, created a state of, a state of fair banking in Canada report earlier in the year. And what they found was that Black Canadians are least likely to report being able to access products from their primary financial institutions. And finally, um, you know, in some ways we think that we're the converted. We are the folks that work in philanthropy, we are the folks that work in impact investing. Um, if you were thinking of this in binary of good and bad, we are the good people. Um, and so when you think about us as good people engaging in impact investing, um, there's been some documented shortcomings. So SSIR reports that foundations and impact investors need to face the ways they are complicit in perpetuating inequality through their capital allocations and upend five structural investment barriers to better serve women and people of color. And when we take a deeper look in Canada, two of the most vocal Canadian foundations who talk about impact investing and how this is driving equity and impact almost exclusively invest in white or male impact fund managers. And this is some research that we're doing at New Power Labs. What I hope that does is it paints a picture of where we're at today. I don't know if any of that will be new to you, but I think it's important for us to understand that if we wanna change the situation, kind of the baseline, our current baseline as Canadians, we're gonna to have to be uncomfortable, we're gonna to have to move, and we're gonna to have to kind of push um, uh, this together. And so when we think about New Power Labs, it's about helping individuals and institutions go on that journey. There's a tremendous amount of initiatives and programs, and we're gonna learn about three phenomenal programs today that are working day to day to solve for creating this equitable financial future. But we're all solving for it in these small community conversations, internal discussions, 
And it's hard to see how that is going to result in large scale change at a systems level. And so that's what New Power Labs, that's why New Power Labs exists. And we exist to do a few things. So we are a platform, uh, we're a registered nonprofit, and we'll be working at, we're launching this year, and, and we're working on four different pillars. We want to convene and not only bring people together to have these conversations on how we do better, how we build the right processes and systems so that we can catch the unconscious bias or discrimination that exists across our processes. We wanna bring people together to have those conversations, but we also wanna go where the conversations are happening. So you'll see, um, you'll see us within existing conferences and um, um, spaces that are having conversations, whether it's in impact investing, venture philanthropy, or traditional blank lending. We wanna make sure that this conversation on equity is always front and center. Research, such a critical aspect. You might have noted that a lot of the statistics I were referencing were not Canadian. And, and, those, and that is a function of what we collect. That is a function of how um, disaggregated our data is and how accessible that disaggregated data is. Uh, uh, each year we'll be coming together and identifying what research, what data-driven research um, output can help shift and move um, the, the, the system forward. The third is really interesting, benchmarking. You know, I think 2020 was also the year of pledges. I know we signed some, I think we've signed three or four of those pledges. And I imagine many of you have also signed a number of pledges. But what is accountability that we have created that enables us to get to the impact that we've committed to. So we are gonna be partnering with the Solidarity Working Group and SIA and starting some work on benchmarking. How do we help at the start impact investors, impact accelerators and intermediaries understand where they are? How do we build a baseline and how do we create accountability for us to actually get that progress that we are discussing so publicly. And the fourth is education. So what we know is that, you know, in, in some ways, the group in this, in this webinar, it, you know, we are the converted. We know that there is inequality across the country. We know that capital is a tool to, to help solve for that inequality. And we are all here today because we wanna be part of that change. Um, what we know as well is that the systems that exist are outside of the control of, of many of us in this room. So we want to ensure that the conversations are not siloed into the social finance, social innovation, philanthropy space, but become mainstream conversations so we can really help push um, the, the, really help push the action forward. And we wanna do this all in a way that is inclusive. Um, I mentioned our three founding partners. Uh, we've also started working with SVX um, and started to collaborate on an initiative as we have with SETSI. Uh, but the goal is let's defragment all of the great work is, that is happening. Let's aggregate that. Let's simplify that. Let's synthesize that and ensure that when we're moving in this journey, we're moving as a collective so we can actually potentially see that change that we're hoping to achieve. And so that is a little bit about New Power Labs, a bit of a teaser to get you hopefully excited and engaged in the type of work Great, and now what I wanna do is introduce three organizations and three phenomenal individuals who are doing really great work. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Adam Spence. He is the founder and CEO of SVX, 
Um, he's helped start up Verge Capital, the Morris Center for Impact Investing, B Labs Canada. I can go on and on and on. Um, but he's also been, uh, you know, I think in some ways we grew up in the sector together from 20, 2008, 2009, um, and has it's been phenomenal to see what he's been able to push and build. Uh, when it comes to impact investing and now kind of leading the conversation on equity. So I'm going to share, um, send it over to Adam to talk about Impact United. Wonderful. Thank you, Narendra. Thanks so much for the opportunity and just delighted to be speaking today. So maybe a, a bit of background. I think we're all familiar with the motivation uh, that we're here uh, for today and, and one that is land longstanding. So there has been you know, incredible um, calls to address injustice, uh, social, economic, and environmental issues across Canada, some that have been added into greater relief uh, as a result of, of the pandemic and, and COVID, but ones that many of us have known have, have been around for many generations. Uh, but I think what we recognize, and this is part of the concept behind Impact United, is that Canadians collectively have the financial resources to respond and to be able to create um, not just imagine or vision, but to create a more equitable, inclusive, and just future. And so uh, there is, you know, in place, when we talk about impact investing, already pretty active impact investing market, and that's one that we operate in. So, you know, there, there's a network uh, um, that we operate in, which has 1,200 plus investors. In Canada, there's $20 billion in assets. Many folks have had a, a positive experience um, in moving this capital, but there's so much more that could be tapped into and dedicated towards you know, social, economic, and environmental justice. There's over a million accredited investors, 3,000 family offices, 6,000 foundations, a lot of folks that would indicate um, that they're interested in investing in, in such ways. But there are gaps um, in, in reaching this particular potential. So gaps in the connections that investors have uh, with one another. Um, there's no single community or movement of these asset owners. Uh, there's capacity gaps in terms of understanding how to invest in this particular way, uh, limited uh, time or, or capability uh, to engage and, and, and make these kinds of investments. And then coordinated action as well. So there's um, you know, few opportunities and, and New Power Labs would be an exception to this, but, but few ways that folks are organizing and engaging in action together to be able to invest um, uh, in, in a way that's gonna create that, that just future. And so Impact United is, as an idea is this broad-based peer-to-peer community movement um, of investors that are seeking to move capital towards social, economic, and environmental justice. Uh, and it's all asset owners, including individuals, families, institutions, faith-based organizations, and, and foundations. And it seeks to fill the gaps uh, that have been identified. So how do we connect these individuals to share, learn, and collaborate with one another? How do we provide an avenue to share insights, information, resources that can benefit not really just the community, but can help us move towards the third mandate, which is facilitating actions. How can we allow investors to be able to collaborate, uh, work together to be able to move more capital into uh, enterprises that might be women-led or, or women-serving or otherwise <clears throat> supporting entrepreneurs that would be from uh, Black, Indigenous, or persons of color um, serving or, or led. And the idea here is, is in that very same vein of New Power Labs is how do we create a movement that is designed to focus on transformation, commitment and action. Um, so not a membership entity, but think of it as a, a campaign like UNPRI or the Giving Pledge or Sustainable Development Goals. We've been fortunate, many organizations have raised their hands uh, to be movement leaders and supporters, CMHC, Community Foundations of Canada, Rima Safa Fund, uh, Trottier Foundation, Trillium Foundation in Spirit, this Nanny Group and Advanced City, and then an outstanding group of knowledge partners as well, including Impact Frontiers, Spring Accelerator, Share, and then New Power Labs, uh, which is, is driving again the movement and agenda around embedding um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion as a part of the practice and, and process of, of uh, investing for impact. And so lots of ways that folks can, can get involved. Um, making a commitment uh, or, or a pledge uh, to, to be a part of this particular movement. There's ways you can, you can support it or, or be a movement leader if you're so inclined to participate in that way. Um, and there'll be a number of, of events that, that we'll be having over the, um, the next uh, you know, few weeks and, and months ahead that you can join. Happy to share our, um, our link to 
uh, our, our community, uh, which is, is online um, in, the, in the chat as well. But really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak today and, and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Impact United, and we'll also be sharing a blog post uh, at the end of this week or early next week, which will give you a direction of how to get in touch with the team at Impact United if you want to join uh, the initiative and the work. And so next, I'm thrilled to introduce Victor. So Victor is the Executive Director of SETSI. And where do I begin? So um, from the work he's doing in Canada, uh, leading up um, you know, really equity and diversity in social innovation. Uh, he also co-founded Redemption Integration Services, which is one of the largest youth-led justice, youth justice agencies in Canada. Um, he has been appointed um, uh, by the premier, uh, the former premier of Ontario, Kathleen Wynne. Um, and also has worked really across the world um, driving this mandate. He's um, with us here, so I'll pass it over to Victor to talk a little bit about the amazing work of, that Setsi is doing in terms of the Solidarity Working Group. Yeah, indeed. Um, thank you so much, Narendra, for your leadership and all the partners that came together um, to make this happen. Um, my name is Victor Bosole. I'm a husband and father of four incredible children. I'm also the founder and the executive director of SETSI, which stands for Social Economy Through Social Inclusion. And the premise is really straightforward when we talk about the Solidarity Working Group. We identified rather quickly that there's a serious lack of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access in the social finance, impact investing, community economic development, social innovation, social economy, various ecosystems that um, purports to create a more transparent, inclusive um, financial system um, in Canada. And we've worked diligently as a collective to onboard unlikely allies and partners um, around those DEI principles. Um, it's been very challenging for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, um, racism in Canada is very um, subversive sometimes, but then very overt as well. A lot of times when we look at some of the microaggressions that manifest on a day-to-day -day basis, they're concealed. Um, or sometimes only experienced by folks um, or people of color or racialized individuals. Um, so right now I actually wanted to go right into what Narendra mentioned in the pre-call just around provocative conversations and what she mentioned in her presentation around being uncomfortable. So I'm gonna give you a few um, current examples of what manifests in the social finance impact investing community. Um, the first example I'll give you is a post meeting um, with a federal MP. I'm gonna use Chatham House rules, so I'm not going to name names, um, but in a post meeting with the federal MP, with one of the largest impact investing tables, literally within the past two weeks, a statement was made in the chat, very simple statement, um, and it was predicated on the minister talking about a project and naming it his baby. Um, and in the chats, one of the partners from the in 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 impact investing space mentioned, who's gonna tell him his baby's ugly? That is a flagrant microaggression, even a macroaggression, because if it was a room for, and I was the only African Canadian in the space at the time, um, and if it was a room full of, let's say, 20 men, and it was a female minister and one woman on the call, if that was that come was made by a man around the woman, I'm pretty sure that that woman would have a very different relationship with the meeting as all the other partners. I'll make another. Um, I'll give you another example. A colleague of mine, and she doesn't even know I know this story, um, but I was in the meeting, um, I was in a meeting after, was in another impact investing table, and they were choosing a board chair for the organization. And after choosing a male board chair, um, the reference was made by a, a female colleague, and it was stated, hey, we need to address this diversity thing, and they, the one African Canadian person in the space, can you be the vice chair? As opposed to looking at all the assets and skill sets that she brings to the table, the only asset they could see was her blackness. Um, and I, I can name a few other narratives around this, but the fact remains the impact investing space is a space that is still very racist, um, a, a space that many folks interacting with face microaggressions and overt racism on a day to day basis. And the challenge that I face as an African Canadian husband, father of four, is the amount of African children sometimes I see on websites, um, the amount of black folks stock images that are used on websites. 
um, when the space is not accommodating, attractive, engaging, or even wants to sustain a relationship with African Canadians. And that's very troublesome because when you look at three prime examples of the importance of engaging vulnerable distinct groups, like let's say the community futures, rural communities identified many years ago that they didn't have voice. Now we have 276 community futures locations across Canada. When you look at the incredible work of Raven Capital and the remarkable capital raise that Paula Kurtz um, and Jeff Sear and his team did, that was because of the resilience of the Indigenous community to build over 57 AFIs because they recognized their voice wasn't heard in the finance space. When you look at the work of Chantier in, um, in Quebec, that was predicated on the fact that the Francophone community recognized they needed an economic voice and they wanted to organize their economic relationships in a meaningful way. But guess what? In all three instances with the Indigenous community, rural communities, and the Francophone communities, there was acknowledgement of disparity, targeted investment, and then meaningful, deep engagement. So I really believe that as Canadians, especially based off the Black squares that Narendra mentioned, we have a unique opportunity once again to try and find a way to create the Canada that I'm sure we all want to see. Thank you so much, Narendra. Thank you. Um, you said so much uh, within that that I, I would want to dig into. Uh, you know, microaggressions, the way racism shows up in Canada is in a way which we don't feel comfortable having that conversation. I think some of that started in 2020, but I, I know my own experience, and I'm happy to share that as a fund manager trying to raise a fund as a woman of color <laughs> has been a fascinating journey, which we can get into. Um, lots of work to do. And one of the things I appreciate about the Solidarity Working Group, it's really about creating that movement of people who want to see this change and co-creating what that change could look like. Absolutely. I agree completely. And a lot of times when we think about movements, there's this model that we always want to go to around critical mass. But in peace theory, there's a concept of critical yeast. And I think just getting it to a place that makes sense, where everyone's on the same page around these simple principles of DEI, will, will solve a lot of these issues as it relates to some of the numbers that Dr. Joseph Smith, Lee Ban, and the colleagues at FBC mentioned. Thank you so much, Narendra. Absolutely. And one of the pieces of work that we're partnering, New Power Labs is partnering with the Solidarity Working Group uh, this summer is on research of um, what diversity, equity, inclusion looks like within the social finance space. So looking at uh, those that are deploying capital, the funds, uh, and, and the intermediaries and the accelerators and understanding not only their internal operations, but who and how they flow out capital. And so hopefully that will be something that we can share more broadly and, and you may even be involved in that part. Um, so stay tuned on that. And finally, I want to introduce uh, Jory and another person I've known, I think, for over a decade now. Um, he is a director of finance and impact investing at the Inspirit Foundation. Um, he's been working also, um, if you may know him, as part of the Youth Social Innovation Capital Fund, which was an impact investment fund um, and has been a, on a personal journey on impact in addition to, I think, a professional journey on, on driving impact. So over to you, Jory, to talk about your work within kind of the public side. Thanks so much, Narinder. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for, for having me here. It's a pleasure. Okay, so uh, I'm with the Inspirit Foundation, and um, I, I think, you know, a few years, I think many of you know, a few years back, we committed to 100% impact portfolio, which for us meant uh, impact investing across asset classes which in turn meant that we were essentially going to essentially really turn over our entire portfolio asset class by asset class. And uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020, uh, we went on searches for new investment managers with a public, like specifically affiliated with a, with a public asset class. So 2018 was fixed income, 2019 was global equities, 2020 was Canadian equities. And we weren't surprised at, at this finding, but uh, we were certainly disappointed that um, every year, those three years, the same conclusion um, emerged in that these major investment managers tend to be governed by older and, and whiter men. Um, again, un unsurprising, um, but uh, in our uh, small way, we did try to, to push those organizations forward in terms of um, cementing their commitments 
uh, to DEI formally in, in our actual agreements with them. So that was a small, small thing that we did and actually was very, very time consuming um, and took a lot of effort. Uh, so that was in the back of our mind. And, and then another piece, um, and I'll connect the two, um, is that a few years back, uh, we, along with a number of others, um, funded a project led by Sharon Natoa uh, called the Reconciliation and Responsible Investment Initiative. And the initial scope of, the, of that project was really around engaging uh, big public Canadian companies around some of the principles that TRC, specifically around uh, Indigenous governance and leadership, uh, employment, contracting, and free and prior informed uh, consent in terms of land use. So we, we had those two uh, thoughts in our mind, um, this project that we've uh, funded with Sharon and Toa uh, around um, engaging big uh, Canadian public companies around some of the principles of the TRC and also uh, our experience around um, the investment management space being uh, governed by and led by older whiter men. So we thought, well, can, can we essentially combine some of those uh, principles into one project um, and uh, try to create a framework that engages the investment management sectors along some of the principles of DEI. Uh, this is a very new project. It, it's not off the ground yet, um, but we have enlisted SHARE to be the backbone of this project. Um, and we're going to be, um, one of the first steps of this project is, is yes, to raise more funding, but also to uh, engage two other, at least two other uh, partner organizations, um, one Indigenous led, and the other uh, very much steeped in with expertise and experience around DEI. Uh, and we're hoping that that, um, I guess, conglomerate of, of partners will uh, then build a framework to engage these investment managers, um, hold them accountable. Uh, and really the idea is, is for these partners to um, represent the clients of, of these big investment managers. So we're talking about, you know, the big financial institutions, the public and private investment managers uh, represent those clients and, and uh, help share their voice around uh, some of these principles. So it, it's early days, but we think very, very exciting. Um, we think this could be a potential game changer in the at least public investment management space in Canada, which represents, I mean, a whole lot of money. Uh, and um, we're really looking forward to this. Uh, I did, I think, Wendy, I think you're on the call. I think I saw your voice. I did stick your, your logo in with Dragonfly Ventures is, is helping um, fund the project as well. And um, so it's really nice to be a co-funder with them. And we're just looking forward to getting this off the ground and seeing where this takes us. And sorry, sorry, Narendra, I just, if anyone wants to get involved in one way or another, just feel free to reach out directly to me. Amazing, thank you, Jory. So, you know, those are three, um, just going to go back a few slides here. Um, those are kind of three initiatives that are happening that would be part of this new power, new power labs platform. So going back to what we're trying to do is aggregate, consolidate, share out, and kind of build that momentum and that movement um, uh, for folks to understand where to go, how to get support, and then complement where we're lacking in Canada. And you know, one of the conversations I've had with a number of executive directors of foundation is foundations um, is that you know, on in one hat, they're thinking about philanthropy. Uh, many have acknowledged and recognized that their philanthropy tends to primarily go to um, white-led organizations. Now, those organizations may serve communities of color, but they tend to go, it, it tends not to be in inclusively distributed. And on the other hat, they're thinking about their, their endowment and their assets. And again, same type of, same type of kind of reflection is happening, happening, whether it's their impact investing portfolio, or whether kind of it's a broader investment portfolio, it still tends to be controlled um, by white and male individuals. So I think, I think this is a really interesting moment we're in where we have this awareness, we're seeing this acknowledgement, and then it's really to us to say, are we gonna kind of continue to uh, step up, baby, take baby steps to change, or can we actually commit to something more bold, um, and, and more impactful as we move forward. So with that, 
Um, I am going to move on to Q and A, and unshare my screen. And and the goal of the next bit is to not only give more clarity on what each of us are doing, but actually um, kind of go deeper on some of these more provocative type questions. Uh, so the first is how do you grade us in social finance in Canada when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? So again, we're talking social finance. You know, my 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 kind of bold, broad reflection has been the the systems and the leadership in place in traditional investing is what we see in social finance in Canada. But, but I'd love to hear from Jory, Adam, Victor. How do we do? Are we a plusing this, or is it kind of more like a D minus? B minus, well said. <laughs> Adam, Jory, what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know what, I think I'll take the, um, the dichotomous scale of pass fail. Um, yeah, right now we're, we're certainly failing, um, but I do think there's a tremendous opportunity for change and maybe I'm, I'm too naive and too optimistic, but um, uh, I do think that there's uh, an opportunity here because impact investing is relatively new. Um, there are new organizations emerging and there are new divisions of uh, bigger organizations that are focusing on impact investing. And I think this is a, a really opportune time um, for some change, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it would be a stretch to give us a D, um, you know, in order to get past the fail point, but um, so why I might uh, offer that reflection is present circumstances would have us at a fail point, but momentum, um, and hopefully what we'll talk about this, is hopefully pushing us um, into getting towards a passing grade, uh, but it may take um, a generation, a generational effort to be able to get us uh, to where we need to go. Um, we don't want that to be the case, um, but it is uh, based on the, the, the cultural and necessary movement. Um, it's going to require a whole lot of time and effort to push us to, to where we have to be. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face is um, it's very cyclical in terms of momentum. There's momentum that's happened many times. I'm not sure if it's a new concept. Um, the Community Eth Investment Act happened in the States in 1977. And there were civil rights leaders that fought and helped to bring about CDFIs. And when you look at community development financial institutions, like um, those are the precursors of social finance, impact investing, VP, venture philanthropy. So yes, every few decades, like every few years, there's a new buzzword or term to repackage and repurpose um, principles that have been around for a while. But what hasn't changed is who leads, who owns the tables, who's sitting at the table, who gets invited to the table. Um, so definitely there are like events that, are ca um, that catalyze folks and create some momentum around um, addressing some of these structural issues around racism and diversity, equity, and access. But as soon as, it's, it's almost the sectors, these aforementioned sectors have short memories. As soon as kind of the, it dies down, it's business as usual. Let's partner with the usual suspects, it's easier. Um, and I, so, I, so I really wanna challenge both of you. And Jory, we're just meeting and I'm actually have an email from you, so I'm excited to build. Um, but I really wanna say that I don't think it's a new space, a new ecosystem. Um, and I don't believe that this is the first time there's been momentum around some of these issues. Can, can I pick up on that as well? Yeah, um, absolutely. Brother. That's okay. I think um, I certainly agree. I, I don't. Um, I think one other piece of the equation as well is what are the underlying? Because uh, we often miss this out of structural, um, cultural, and political and policy uh, frameworks that underlie all of this as well. We want to move capital. Want to move business. So it is driven uh, towards <clears throat> ownership and wealth creation amongst those who face tremendous barriers but have tremendous assets. But there's a whole other underbelly of um, policy and cultural infrastructure that needs to be changed and transformed concurrently. So we do need to move the, the structures of assets and ownership and business, but there's a whole other system that we, we cannot forget and also need to move. And so. I think the CDFI movement, that maybe that was part of the, the gambit back then is, okay, we'll spend some time, we'll, we'll create these economic structures, but the other, the other pieces, which are just as if not a more important, remained untransformed and unchanged. And so that's, 
that's the part of the, the battle um, that, that we have in front of us. So again, that's just from my own perspective. So let's go deeper on that. What are the blocks? You've identified a few of the blocks that prevent progress. You know, I think a lot about, you know, the way investment committees define fiduciary responsibility, the way we determine risk, um, um, the way we uh, determine or kind of value leadership and who is a leader, what a leader looks like. There's you know, a lot of pieces there, but what are some of those more maybe uh, uh, kind of day-to-day -day blocks and potentially those system level blocks that, that all of you are seeing in in what is preventing us from getting to that equity point. I can jump in. I think um, one of the obvious blocks to me is just the pipelines. Like how many um, diverse fund managers are there? Who's creating cohorts of new emerging fund managers that understand um, fiduciary responsibility? Are folks sharing power and sharing Rolodexes I and mean, information? Um, so there, the, the, the premise of this social battleground in this ecosystem is predicated on capitalism, unfortunately. It's still very zero sum. It's still about who can access the greatest liquidity, how to move capital to those that you know and potentially trust or who, those that look like you. Um, and that's, those are for me the clear and obvious barriers. Um, and until we find ways and means to partner outside of the usual suspects, engage folks on the margins and the periphery of these ecosystems and actually build the pipelines so that when folks say, well, how do I find this specific group in, uh, intermediaries in this group? Or how do I find fund managers? You can say, oh yeah, sure, go, go here. And like, it'll be much easier. But until folks actually invest in building those pipelines, it's gonna be the same one. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that, Victor. Um, and I'll, I'll speak sp specifically to the project that um, we're looking to support um, around investment managers. Uh, managers. You know, for, for us, I, I won't get into the impetus too much of, of uh, or the challenges, but I will say that I, we, we do think that the the way for change when it comes to those major organizations is, is as Victor said, through money, it's through clients. And, and that's why we're looking to essentially aggregate the um, collective voices of, of a client base of a specific manager or the managers in, in, in general, and have that represented by uh, a conglomerate of partners around engaging these, these organizations around DEI. Um, that's that's kind of our, our theory of how to move things forward in that specific project in that specific space. A few other things to um, from from our perspective would be kind of the capital infrastructure. So I think has been, been talked about the capital infrastructure of those that own assets um, and where they place it. I think the capital management structures, um, which both are, are not dedicated and oriented. Um, and or may have the understanding or tools, or as was said, the connections uh, to be able to uh, invest uh, with this particular lens and approach. I think also the capacity infrastructure, uh, which again, as is owned um, or is dedicated towards, um, be it women, black, indigenous, persons of color, uh, a variety of, of entrepreneurs and organizations, um, uh, you know, that they have not been necessarily funded or supported to, to build capacity, uh, to have ownership, direction, and, and leadership. And then the networks, which are not necessarily plugged and connected in, as, as, um, as Victor, Victor said, in, into the larger systems. Uh, I think there's also something to be said about mainstream versus niche infrastructure. Um, you know, in the, in the mainstream, whether it's large financial institutions or, or large asset owners or, or managers, um, you know, would have intention or perhaps marketing and brand around it but really a lot of this stuff is is, is probably happening in in niche very hyper specific intermediary organizations that would um, be engaged in, in this kind of activity so it's how do we convince the mainstream to change their policy and practice so it's oriented towards uh, the change that we're seeking absolutely thank you guys now there's a, a comment from uma i wanted to share with the group and there's a few other quotes questions in the chat I will get to, um, but she wants to add that uh, the CFOs and board finance subcommittees and foundations and charities ultimately choose the fund managers to invest their funds. 
and there's a disconnect within that process. And I know I've had conversations with them, some executive directors um, who are very much aligned, um, see the value, but once it gets kind of into the CFO or fine in, um, investment committee hands, then um, a perception, the perception part, the other kind of challenges of that traditional structure that tends to value, I would say maleness and whiteness um, really discredits people um, who are women and really discredits people of color as part of the process. So on that, um, can you each share a data point or stat in the this, in this sector that you are passionate about changing? that should not be what it is today and kind of through your work or through your commitment, you're working to, to shift. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll jump in here and I'm, you know, it's this project that we're working on, I'll just go back to it because um, as we I went through the same process three years in a row, um, we had uh, very similar interactions around conversations uh, with diversity, equity, inclusion with these large organizations. And it, it, um, what we have found is that uh, the, the junior workforce um, potentially uh, has way more relevance to diversity, equity, inclusion than the senior um, levels of the workforce, including the board of directors. And um, that that's really stuck with us uh, as an organization. And that's exactly what we're trying to change because that's, that's really unacceptable. The pathways, um, the mobility is is something, or the lack of mobility is, is really unacceptable in our eyes. One of my former advisors was uh, Marc-Andre Blanchard he, when he was the, the head of uh, uh, McCarthy Tetro, and we I remember having a conversation about pathways of lawyers, because at the at the at the kind of junior level, you actually have quite a bit of diversity. You have male female diversity, but what happens is those that are at the partnership level, they are giving kind of the the projects where people are able to shine, the interesting projects, the exciting projects to people who look like them, because they believe that if they are similar to them, they have more trust in the fact that they can handle this project or this piece of work and they will do it well. Um, and so one of the things he was pushing across his partners group was how do you give equal access to opportunities and cases? So it's not just, you know, the, the, the person who went to, you know, the private school that you went to that gets access to the programs and projects, but it's really, I've done in a way that is more democratized. And that, and as they started to push that through the, the organization, they started to see more shifts because then people had the chance to prove themselves. And so I, I, I think about that often because I, I think the people we tap, and I think all of us are in leadership roles, but the people we tap to lead, the we, people we fund, the people we support and enable um, are then given that opportunity to shine and show kind of their um, their impact and, and their ability to, to grow their work. So another stat, Adam, Victor, any any kind of big messy stat that you're working to, to address? Yeah, well, you, you mentioned a few stats from our colleagues, I'm Rebecca, Lee Ban, um, and Dr. Joseph Smith, but I'm a, and you mentioned, I think you said I'm um, 30 percent. So it's actually 30 cents on one of them. 30, 30 cents. Um, yeah. No problem. Right. But um, the 10 billion dollars in assets held by private and public philanthropic foundations, 0.01 percent went to Black-led orgs. Um, that's uh, a scary stat. Um, and I think when you look at just governance, period, um, governance bodies are are not um, diverse at all. Um, and I, I believe that's why you're having those decisions, not just in the philanthropic space, but obviously in the, in, in, in the investment um, impact investing space. And I just want to give an anecdotal um, narrative. I spoke with a colleague of mine two days ago. He has a very large board of directors. RBC just gave them $1.4 million and was supposed to position a board member from RBC on his board. And RBC, I didn't even know this, FIs actually have a new policy. RBC was not able to position one of their board members on his board because his board has eight white men and three white women and did not meet their DEI policy. 
So the fact that FIs are starting to step up in that way, and if you look at some of the recent announcements in the federal budget announced on April 19th, around the $200 million for the Black-led philanthropic fund, or the $100 million for grants, or even the $221 mil announced in the fall economic statement around Black entrepreneurship, it's clear there's disparities in very specific vulnerable distinct groups that for some reason or another, the impact investing community and the social finance community has not been found a way to keep up with some of these demographic shifts or some of the priorities that are, that are clear. Um, or at least should be clear in terms of diversity. That's a great question. Like what would happen if our foundations would take the same approach in where they put their money or, you know, not necessarily joining the boards of the charities, but were to say, you know, the boards of the charities that we're going to fi uh, finance or fund have to have a certain demographic makeup and that demographic makeup has to be in relationship to the communities you live in or and kind of a combination of you know the Canada that we live in. I think part of the challenge um, is folks are looking at it like it's pie and I'm, I'm going to get less like a smaller piece of the pie if we add emerging leaders or new communities as opposed to looking at it for it's a very lack and scarcity mindset as opposed to saying you know what the plate will get bigger the table will get bigger the room will look nicer. Um, so I think that moving like the, the only way that will happen is if mindset shifts. And that's very challenging because like I said before, a lot of these ecosystems are just kind of spraying perfume on capitalism. Like it's, it's the very similar models um, with definitely good intentions and good people, very progressive, but the paradigms um, of structural racism, institutional racism are, are, are very obvious. And the more data we collect, the more obvious it becomes. Is it feasible for us? And I say us, but I mean, the, maybe us, maybe some of us, uh, maybe the foundations, maybe impact investment funds. Can we give up power? And so I'm going to ask each of you this. How would you give up power? So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to jump in because I, I do think in spirit um, thinks about this quite a bit. Um, we, so in terms of decision making, um, we do really, really, uh, involve a peer group, an external peer group um, that we believe uh, are really dedicated their at least professional lives to um, some of the priorities of the foundation, um, including reconciliation, including addressing Islamophobia, um, but pluralism uh, overall. Uh, so that, that that's one way in our in our decision making process. But uh, the other um, is something that we just did with the foundations for Black communities and. Um, uh, another organization, um, we haven't made an announcement yet, but um, we are actually uh, transferring uh, part of our endowment. So um, we are uh, give, we do give operational grants, but tied to those operational grants, we're just making a full out transfer, capital transfer from our endowment uh, to help seed uh, another organization's endowment, which is what we did at the Foundation for Black Communities. Um, we know that's not everything. We know that's not uh, the entire solution. Um, but that's one way that we're, we're approaching this. I think um, well, one of the ways I try and give up power consistently is just leveraging my lived experience. Um, many times I'm at tables, on boards, um, and I make um, arrangements to partner with folks that I know sometimes don't um, um, fully um, recognize the importance of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access work but I'll still um, participate and engage to ensure that there is at least a voice at the table, which a lot of times leaves me battered and bruised. A lot of times it takes me 45 minutes to recover from some meetings, just venting with my wife. So that's one of the ways that I find, um, I, I try my best to share power um, because I do know that I have a voice and I have leverage in some spaces that's utilized consistently. And another way I try and share power is by amplifying others' works um, at Setsi folks really see me, they see more Jalisa, they see more Ryan. Um, so I'm saying all that to say that it's it's really important, I, I think, to create um, amplify various voices um, and, and to ensure that um, there isn't uh, this monolithic approach. Um, one of the things, that, so there's two things that we're doing at SETI right now. One, some research in terms of the impact investing community and trying to build some cohorts, um, which anyone wants to reach out to me, feel free. Um, but the second thing is um, we're co-developing something called the African-Canadian Governance Pact. 
And the premise for the PATS is there is multiple organizations that have reached out to me over the years consistently on a monthly basis. Can you send our board? I'm at, and, and what I've noticed is um, whenever I enter into an agreement to be on a governance board, I always negotiate with the folks that are engaging me and saying, listen, I'm not interested in being one of. And the path that we're developing right now in the African Canadian community is actually say no. If an organization reaches out to you and says, we want you to be on the board, uh, the, the conversation should be me and who else? Um, and I think that's a really important conversation because if you really scan um, the ecosystem and the lay of the land in terms of social finance, social economy, impact investor, even um, um, performance metrics, like the governance bodies, they'll find one African, like they'll, they'll check the box for the different groups. And that is irresponsible, tokenistic, and very disrespectful. Um, so we developed this, this, this model that we haven't launched yet, but it's to, one, to, to stop that model of the lone wolf, where there's one individual that's the, or consultant or someone that's benefiting from huge institutions engaging them. More importantly, it creates dynamic where there's greater accountability in the ecosystem. So I love that. And you and I have chatted about this type of checking the box quite a bit. Um, one of my favorite comments I receive from foundations all the time when I'm ta talking to them about Marigold Capital, which is an, a gender lens and impact investment fund, they say, but we've invested in Raven. I'm like, oh, <laughs> where to begin on that, on that journey, right? And it's not about checking the box. It's really about thinking about how do you build inclusive portfolios? And it's phenomenal that um, funds like Raven are growing and are driving change, but we need more of that. And I think, I think we're, I think diversity and equity sometimes creates, becomes its own tiny little portfolio. So I've done it. You know, I have one person on the board. I have one fund that is indigenous led. Um, and, and that becomes our ability to, um, that becomes kind of our proof point that we are good people, we're inclusive, but that uh, kind of, it, it essentially allows us not to be reflective of the rest of our work, the rest of our portfolio and the rest of the actions that might be leading to more um, or less inclusivity in our work. Absolutely, and Raven's a prime example. They're trying to raise five, I think they close at 24 million. So there is an appetite. Oh, 30, there you go. So 30. there is an appetite. <laughs> um, Adam, what about you? How do you think about power? How do you, how do you give up power? It's a, it's a great question and one that I think I'll have to reflect a little more on, but I think one is it's a part of daily practice, right? That the idea is that it's not about one single action, one policy, one program you change, but, but a part of the day-to-day -day things that you do. So some of it is, you know, when we engage in partnerships and, and practice with others, that we ask the question, are we engaging uh, communities outside of our own? Um, which I think is, is pretty critical, whether it's an event, whether it's a program, whether it's a project. I think uh, to Victor's point as well, in terms of singular individual ownership, or institutional, organizational ownership, never just one. The idea that, that many uh, need to address these challenges collectively and together is absolutely the, the approach that, that we need to be taking. I think it's also about how do you dedicate kind of your organization's resources and whatever capacity or efforts that they are towards achieving these, these aims. We all have some form of political resource or otherwise organizational capital. And so for us, you know, doing things like spending time and, and focused on developing partnerships like WOZEN, the Women of Ontario Social Enterprise Network, uh, which has been a wonderful partnership initiative uh, driving um, you know, an equity um, agenda. Um, so I think well, those, are, those, are, those are some things or activities that um, we do. And it's also about making sure it's a part of your own governance and, and business practice as well. Uh, that uh, in leadership positions, you have to be able to live kind of the values that you, you promote and, and desire uh, to be able to advance. And so that's certainly what we, we seek to do as an organization. But I think also a great question that, that I and, and we need to think more about. So thank you for asking it. No problem. And, and I love the part where, you know, it's both an external exercise and an internal exercise. So, and, and that's, I think at an institutional level, the way you flow funds out, who you empower to lead, but also um, in, internally as an organizational level, who has power, 
who has ownership, who has control, and then at an individual level. Um, so thank you all for sharing kind of insight into that. And, and you know, part of what we want to do with New Power Labs have more of these conversations because it's so important that we get um, to, I think, what the core of, of why change is so hard is we all like power is hard to change. Power is hard to share. And until we kind of crack that nut, I worry about what progress can look like. Um, we have a question from Sarah. Uh, I love Bill Young. Um, and so any kind of Bill question has to kind of come to the top of the list. Um, so you know how, and everyone has probably heard Bill talk about uh, legislating foundations to have 100% invested in impact uh, or their AUM invested in impact. Um, what are your thoughts? Is this, is this feasible? Should we be doing this? A any, any reaction from the panel? Well, Bill's organization um, starts with social value. And I think part of the challenge is really just unpacking what social value means. Um, and a lot of times when we talk about the word social, folks are very interested in the finance part of social finance, but not really the social aspects because social means everyone. Um, if you're part of an ecosystem that remains stratified and exclusionary for a decade, two decades, and you're a leader in this space and you're not pressing DEI work, it's, um, it's an indictment. You're, you're, at some point, you become complicit in the ecosystem. So I'm, I'm for anything, or any legislation or policy that will definitely um, impact the underserved and marginalized in Canada. But I believe to arrive at that point, there needs to be a real understanding of what social value is, or else we're going to be funding the exact same folks and leveraging capital to the exact same individuals so they can circulate their resources amongst themselves. Yeah, I, sorry, I've just, yes, 100% to 100%. Um, I think that needs to happen. I think it's it's pretty much inevitable. I mean, that's my hope, actually. Um, but just because we commit to 100% impact portfolio doesn't doesn't mean we're making all that much impact, right? We really have to be intentional with, with these investments. Um, but yeah, broadly speaking, I don't see why this wouldn't happen. And it's very, very, very possible. The pipeline is growing um, in a few years. I don't think there really will be much of an excuse not to. Yeah. Um, and maybe we can, we can still talk about endowments and move over to the conversation of family foundations. Um, you know, there is what billions and billions of dollars that sit in family foundations across Canada. And, and the question from the attendee asks, uh, what what do you think needs to happen with family foundations in terms of, you know, generations of a single family uh, running the governance of a sizable endowment? And, you know, I, I reflect on examples where um, where there's been a proactive change in how this is run, like the Laidlaw Foundation um, is one that comes to mind. Um, but it is it is interesting. You know, I've had many conversations with with families around um, endowments in perpetuity or rundown uh, funds? Um, where do folks, how do folks on this panel feel that um, the role of family foundations can kind of support and enable kind of this movement to greater equity? And how should we be thinking about that governance? Maybe I'll kick it off. One of the things that I've seen is is really, you know, I think I think some family foundations keep the the board exclusively to families members, and so that opening that up uh, brings a lot of diversity, especially if you're uh, trying to solve a specific social issue. Making sure you have folks with lived experience and, and kind of closer to that issue can be, I think, very impactful. I work with um, a friend of mine has a family uh, foundation and I've helped her um, democratize access to that capital. So from now on, they do open calls um, and it's really about finding the best, highest impact charities to support versus the charities that sit in their first or second layer of networks. Yeah, I'm going to be very diplomatic just because I, I try my best not to offend. I like to call in as opposed to calling folks out. Um, I think that um, when it comes to family foundations, I, I have deep concerns about some of, the, some of them engaging in accessing public funds. 
um, or trying to make recommendations or lead steering committees associated with public dollars. Um, because when you have um, sizable capital, small nonprofits, organizations, SPOs shouldn't be competing with you to access capital if you already have capital. Um, I also believe that the bigger the family foundation, um, depending on, um, <laughs> depending on, I, I guess the size, because there's some huge family foundations. I believe that when you look at annual reports and when you look at how they share their capital, it may actually um, um, be important that an organization or groups are formed to actually investigate how a capital came to exist. Um, because if you are approaching a billion dollars in Canada, is, is, is there stolen land involved in those resources? Is there free labor involved in those resources? Um, and, and those are real questions that folks are scared to ask um, when you're talking about huge size of resources and clear commitments to not fund and engage very particular demographics. Um, and it becomes a slippery slope. Smaller family foundations, um, democratizing, it makes sense for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but some of the largest players, um, I feel are, are sometimes very troublesome when I look at how they disperse resources. <clears throat> One other way to, to look at it is in terms of the, the chain of, of getting uh, family foundations from where they are to where we need and they need to, to be. And so part of it, I think is, is engaging kind of the, um, you know, senior leadership of the organization, including the, the um, typically the patriarchs as it is currently organized as well as the chief investment officers. So they have a clear and pressing understanding of, of the need as well as the opportunity um, to be able to invest with this particular lens and approach. And I think the evidence clearly bears it out. Um, and there is often a, you know, a need as well to convince on, on that particular perspective. And I think part of also uh, the engagement approach is how do you show and connect with peers that are also doing investing in this particular way, doing it successfully, while also having an impact. And you can use case examples like InSpirit Foundation, which is uh, done an outstanding job. I'm not saying that just because Jory's on, on a panel, but um, uh, there, there's many other foundations in Canada and the US that, that have done that as well. And then how do we also provide connections into uh, both mainstream as well as niche you know, advisors, managers, uh, and identify this as, again, an opportunity and need for them to be able to move. Um, and that, and that, you know, underwrapping all of this is is the case that there is the 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 requirement to act from an economic, from a social, and environmental lens. All points us in the direction that you have to do this. Um, and and so uh, I think that we can convince family foundations on all of those marks. Um, and I said also by by talking and connecting with their peers. Yeah, I'll add that my experience with family offices is that they can be the most catalytic. Um, they can have the less bureaucracy around the investment process and, and, and approach and can actually spark and catalyze um, the impact investing space um, in a way that's much more equitable if they choose to do that. I think like that's where I see the power of this the, the, the capital that sits within family offices and, and would be excited to talk to anyone who wants to dig in on a few other ways of, of thinking through that. Now, I know we're approaching time and we have, a, I think, at least four or five or six questions that we did not get to, um, but I do want to touch on this idea of movement before we end. How do we build a movement and what are we trying to do? And I'm going to kind of circle that back to New Power Labs. Um, New pa Today was a bit of a teaser of, of what we want New Power Labs um, to be as we build out the platform, co-created hopefully by many in this room. Uh, but the goal is to really take these conversations we're have be, having in silos, take these conversations we may be having in private, and take that bold step to kind of come together to push it forward. Um, so I encourage you to reach out if you're interested to learn more about New Power Labs. Um, but before I pass it over to Innes, two or three words on what do we need when we're building a movement, what do we need to make sure we have in place? Victor, Adam, Jory, kind of quick sign bites before I get kicked off um, or muted by Innes. <laughs> love <laughs> like for me it's such a simple principle to love other people 
find ways and means to engage folks in a real way and look at people as humans, not, not, not like, like actually literally put on your blinders and actually say, you know what, I want to make an impact. And that means that I actually have to be inclusive. I have to have a diverse approach. I have to engage equitably and responsibly. Like, so for me, it just boils down to the principle of love and sharing and cooperation, very simple principles that we learn in the sandbox. But at some points, things get blurry as we get older. I'll just say we need, oh, Jerry, go ahead. No, no, you're up. Okay, sure. I, I'll just say we need all of you. Like that, I think that's the point. Um, all of you that are on the panel, as well as all of you that are, that are watching and listening, um, and all of you inclusive of the 37 million people in Canada and beyond. Yeah, I think we need investment. So we need to put our money where our heart is um, and uh, also accountability. Amazing. Adam, my Jordan. Hand, my hand's not up, so I hit the button by accident. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm just saying, I thought you were just giving us a high five. Um, Adam, Jory, Victor, thank you so much for the conversation today and everyone who joined us. We hope this is one of many as we think through and, and co-create a financial future in Canada that is more equitable. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Narendra, for putting this together. Thank you to Tracy who's been uh, in the background <laughs> during this webinar, who has really helped us tremendously also putting um, this conversation forward for you. Um, and I just wanted to say that before we close the webinar, uh, we will um, have a sort of a short survey that will pop on your screen. So please take the time to answer. It really uh, helps us in developing uh, the content for uh, future webinars. So thank you so much, everyone, for this inspiring conversation. Very informative, sometimes challenging, but very uh, timely and uh, important conversation to have. And uh, hopefully we'll see um, each other meet again uh, to discuss once the, the, the initiative is launched, uh, to see where it goes uh, and uh, really uh, share with you, you know, the developments of this initiative. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>